Good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to just say thank you very much for the opportunity to come to Iowa. I missed a, um, the last snowstorm in New York. My wife's not talking to me, but that's OK. <laughs> so she had to shovel the snow with my son. So thank you. I want to thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, let's get on. I just want to tell you a little bit about WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society. We were founded by Teddy Roosevelt in 1895 and the Boone and Crockett Club, uh, basically to do two things. One was to create a zoological garden in New York City, and the other was to save wildlife around the world, very much similar to the mission of the Blank Park Zoo. And what we've done, uh, basically, from the beginning is really saving species. And this is one of those iconic photos. As many of you may know, the, bif the bison or the buffalo was near extinction. There were 30 million bison. Uh, we were down to 21 in the wild. Well, um, when you think about it, um, you, you probably don't think of the Bronx as one of those places where conservation happens, but we actually bred the bison uh, at the Bronx Zoo, and uh, we then shipped them out west. So many of the bison that you'll see in wildlife refuges originate from the Bronx. So just a little tidbit that you can take home tonight. And, um, you know, and we actually are celebrating our 120th anniversary, so 120 years later, we actually work in 65 countries in 15 priority landscapes, and we are committed to protecting about 50% of the world's biological diversity. And we do that, as, as, as was just mentioned, from the Bronx Zoo. We run the four zoos in the aquarium in New York. We have about 4.2 million visitors at our facilities every year. So um, scientists are, you know, we were founded by scientists, and, and uh, everything that we do, we try to base in the work that's being done in the field. And two of our scientists, Fiona Maisel and Samantha Stringberg, had done a, a seminal study of the, literally the loss of elephants. And there's, there's arguments whether they're species or subspecies, but there's fundamentally two groups of ele elephants in Africa. There's savanna elephants, and then there's forest elephants. And um, sh they had done this study of forest elephants, and they had found that overall about 35,000 elephants had been killed in, uh, in Africa in 2012. Basically, that works out to 96 a day. So that's what, what, like, why is it called the 96 elephants campaign? Unfortunately, that's because 96 are killed every day. And when you think about specifically forest elephants, at one point there were about 320,000 forest elephants. Now it's down to about 80,000. So basically, in 10 years, 76% of the, of the forest elephant population has been wiped out. So probably within the next five to 10 years, if nothing changes, forest elephants will be gone, and then savanna elephants will follow shortly thereafter. So overall, in 1980, there were about 1.2 million um, Africa, elephants in Africa. They're now under 400,000. So this is the scale of what we're talking about. And why is this happening? Uh, does anybody here know who this is? This is Joseph Kony, the leader of the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, what's happening is um, terrorist groups, criminal groups, are now involved in the uh, elephant trade, the ivory trade. They're using it specifically for what's called bush currency. They will kill these animals. Uh, and how do they kill them? One of the famous ways uh, that's been done is they would put cyanide into a watering hole kill everything in that area, then go in and take the, and take the, um, uh, the tusks out. And Joseph Coney, there's a group that we've worked with um, through, um, it's called the Enough Project. They are with the Center for American Progress. They sent two researchers into Garamba National Park uh, last year. And what they did is they were just trying to find out, how do we stop Joseph Coney? They're a, gen they're a group that focuses on genocide. And what they realize is one of the ways that we can get rid of Joseph Coney is to stop selling ivory because he's using ivory to fund his activities. So what we've done is we've come up with a strategy, which is really a three-pronged strategy, which is stop the killing, stop the trafficking, and stop the demand. And stop the killing, basically, if we, if we have well-trained guards on the ground, uh, the study showed that there would be seven times more elephants in, as opposed to where there are non-trained guards. So fundamentally, our study that we did with Fiona and Sam shows, gives us a, a roadmap on what we need to do to make this work. And what we really realized from the, literally from the beginning, and it's one of the reasons why I'm here, is um, we cannot do this alone. 
This is not the Wildlife Conservation Society alone. It's not even Blank Park Zoo alone. It's something that we have to do together. So what we've done is we've expanded the work that we're doing. Uh, we now work in, um, if you look here in the bottom uh, right, in the, in the area of Nias and Mozambique and Sulu. This is really at the front lines of the crisis right now. But we've been working with many other partners like the African Wildlife Foundation, et cetera, to really ramp up the work that we're doing on the ground. And how do we do that? Well, um, we use very high-tech equipment, GPS-based equipment. Um, it's called SMART. Basically, what we do is we give GPS trackers so that we can now figure out where um, these uh, poachers are going. We can use this information then and share that with the military so that we can stop it. And then we use the most low-tech, which are, ho are dogs. Uh, dogs have become very important in our trafficking efforts so that we can stop um, uh, the ivory from going from one transit point to another. And um, as you'll see, we've now started to bring dogs into the equation uh, in many ports. And these ports go from Mombasa and Kenya all the way up to Togo in West Africa. Because uh, the problem is you kind of close one hole and it opens up somewhere else. But the question really at the end of the day is about demand. And we hear a lot about demand, and you may have read some articles about China. And um, unfortunately, as China has, uh, fortunately, China has increased in terms of its economy. But unfortunately for wildlife, and specifically for, uh, for elephants, one of the ways that they show face and that they show value and they show luxury is by giving gifts. And, and one of the gifts that's given is ivory. And it's really a status symbol. So therefore, you've got some really cultural issues here where people will give ivory as a way of showing uh, their respect and show that they have reached a certain level of wealth. And as you look at some of these numbers, uh, it's a really daunting task when you think about 84% of people in China still intend to buy ivory. We've really reached a point where we need to be educating people on the ground. And how are we doing that? We're looking at it from two different ways, you know, kind of a grassroots and grass tops for any people studying politics. You, know, you have to start at the top and really talking with senior leaders, and then you also have to work through social media to reach out to the, um, to the community writ large. And uh, one of the ways that we've identified is by using social media and reaching out to young people in China and people, now what's interesting, in China, there's a greater use of social media than there is in the United States, if you can believe it. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons why that is, but fundamentally, they just spend more time online. And they have their own system, just like we have Twitter and Facebook, they have something called Weibo. We actually hired a former executive of Weibo to help us figure out what is a strategy that we can use that works there. But the demand issue is not solely in China or in Asia. I took this picture on 58th Street in New York City. Um, in New York City, you can go on 58th Street, there are actually two stores, one next to each other, that are selling ivory. And then there is a major department store, and I know this is being taped, so I won't mention what the name of the store is, um, that was selling a lovely uh, uh, ivory necklace for a mere $20,000. So, that's here in New York, uh, here in New York, I don't even know where I am. Um, that's in New York, uh, in California, uh, there is a study that was just done that in Los Angeles, 90% of, um, of the ivory that was for sale is actually illegal. So what you fundamentally have is places where ivory is for sale openly, people don't understand what the laws are, and you're, what you're doing is you're creating markets and you're killing elephants. And what you're really doing is funding terrorism in Africa. So in July of 2013, we brought together some of the leaders of, um, of the community, uh, there's the president of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums in this photo, um, there's, the, um, there's the president of the African Wildlife Foundation, I'm looking at representatives from the National Geographic, and of course also there's Secretary Clinton. And she's taken this issue on and has been one of our staunchest supporters and has really helped us to, to raise awareness. And it was interesting to see how we were able to get her to support our position of stop the killing, stop the trafficking, and stop the demand. I always love putting this, this is her ninth tweet ever, so we were a top 10 tweet for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> And what we did working with, uh, with the Clinton Global Initiative, we literally brought together seven leaders from Africa 
to make a call to the world to stop buying ivory. Because what was really important was this should not be us as Americans telling Africa what they should or shouldn't do. We wanted the African leaders to be telling the world. And um, what we did is we really broke down some significant barriers because many people felt, oh, maybe we should still sell ivory, maybe we should still trade ivory. Well, fundamentally, what we did is we were able to bring those pieces together, those groups together, and those countries together under this call for a moratorium on the sale of ivory. And we now have 11 African leaders that have made this pledge publicly. So the commitments that the groups that have worked, it's a long list, but fundamentally what we've tried to do is really bring the community together. And again, under that concept of partnership, under that concept that we cannot do it alone, that we need to be working as one collective. What did we agree to? Well, under Stop the Killing, we realized that we, there are about 50 sites that hold about two-thirds of the world's elephants. And what we want to try to do is make sure that we hold on to these sites so that when the trafficking stops and the demand diminishes, there will still be populations of elephants remaining. Under Stop the Trafficking, what we've agreed to is really we want to try to do a better job of intercepting ivory at ports. We want to increase and improve law enforcement on the ground. But I want you to remember that last one. We've been really working on the issue of stopping the sale of ivory in countries around the world, but here in the United States as well. And on the demand side, we really want to start tackling this demand question of how do we get people to realize that when they're buying ivory, they're killing elephants. So we made a, a, a communal pledge that we wanted to try to get 10 million actions versus social media. And we, as, as the Wildlife Conservation Society, working with the zoo community, pledged 1 million of those actions. So 96 elephants was born. We realized that we needed to do something a bit different as a community. Um, I will tell you that most zoos are not that active on the, in the advocacy world. Uh, I will tell you what usually happens, you come to the zoo, you have a wonderful experience, and then you go home. And candidly, that's not the way it can work anymore. What we need to do is we need to bring people here, we need to educate them on what's happening in the world, they need to see and be inspired, and then we need them to take action. And that's what 96 Elephants is really all about. And we had some very clear and specific goals of what we want to try to do. Number one was build this constituency for elephants, make, make people realize um, what was going on. Second is this whole idea of ivory bans and, and creating moratoria nationally as well as state by state level. And then also increasing resources and protections to save elephants. So I go back to partnerships. Um, this has been key to our success. Um, we've literally been able to bring together um, you know, from Hard Rock Cafe to the Cub Scouts. Um, we've really wanted to make this a cradle to cane, not to grave, but cradle to cane. Uh, so we have all groups involved. And this not, it's not just for people that are my age, but it's for young people as well. They all have to be involved in this. And um, I was going to, Justice for Elephants is part of uh, DoSomething.org. Are any of you college students have heard of that? DoSomething.org? OK. Well, there's about 2.6 million young people that are part of that. And uh, their logo is, a, is a, they want the world to suck less. That's their term. <laughs> and of course, when we talk about partnerships, we have to, I have to always give a, tip my hat to the Blank Park Zoo because um, we cannot do this alone. And, and Blank Park is helping here in Iowa to make sure that that case is being made. And um, because of the work of the Blank Park Zoo and this partnership that we've, been, that we've created, we've been able to bring incredible people to this campaign. Candidly, I don't even know who half of these people are. But the younger, you know, the only one I know is the Senator Frist, uh, great, great Republican senator in the corner. That's the only one I knew. And Billy Joel, actually. I love Billy Joel. And that's Deepak Chopra. It's just been this kind of interesting collection of people that have come from left and right and, and center. But um, yeah, it's Gloria Steinem next to Senator Frist. Uh, it's, it really shows when you have an issue and what you can do when you bring people together. Does anybody know who the woman in the right, bottom right-hand corner is? Ciara. Well, I am impressed. I'm impressed. So Ciara is part of our effort. And that's Audra McDonald's was great. 
And, and what we've been able to do with the campaign is really not only bring these celebrities and, and engage them, but we've also been able to bring on board Horizon Media uh, and DDB Worldwide and Latham & Watkins, the law firm, all on a pro bono basis. Each one of them has given their time, and then we've then been able to give these resources back to the community to use in their various markets. And what we've also done is we've found different ways of engaging people. And one of the things that we found is, if any of you are fans of the Antiques Roadshow, they were actually still um, appraising ivory on the show, right? And it was just kind of unbelievable that in 2014 that we're appraising literally ivory pieces and there's no conversation or discussion about what's happening. So, I reached out three times to Antiques Roadshow and asked them, can you please stop uh, appraising these ivory pieces? Um, and if you are going to appraise ivory in any way, shape, or form, please tell the story of what's happening, how these animals are being killed. Well, they, um, they decided to ignore my three uh, requests for help. So what we decided to do was to do a video. Uh, and uh, we went viral with this video, which I'm going to share with you. I am so excited about this piece. I picked it up at a New York antique shop and I was told it was from Africa. And with the demand I keep hearing about in China for ivory, I really wanted to find out how much you think it's worth. Well, before we talk about its value, let's talk about its provenance. So this tusk came from an African elephant that was ruthlessly stalked and gunned down. About 96 elephants are killed every day in Africa for their ivory. It's about 35,000 a year. Scientists say forest elephants in about 10 years will probably be extinct, but hey, you gotta go sometime. The elephant was probably still alive when they hacked its face off with a machete. Could have been a mother with a calf. They probably shot the calf too. If not, the calf wandered around for a few days before it starved to death, but that's natural selection. I mean, look at the detail of this carving. You know, the child soldier that shot the elephant probably with one of the rebel groups that's currently destabilizing the continent. You know, they use ivory to buy guns so they can continue to murder and rape and pillage and child slavery and so forth. If there was a park guard trying to protect the elephant, he may have been murdered. But, I mean, what a beautiful piece. It's exquisite. So, now that you know the cost behind it, do you really want to know how much it's worth? I got to tell you, it's very hard to make that funny. And um, what we did there was really help tell the story in a way that was engaging. And uh, we literally did a thunderclap where we got people to come together to take over the social media page of, um, of the uh, Antiques Roadshow. And uh, we, had, we were hoping to get about four or 500 people to do it. We had 1,900 people do it. And once we did it, and once this went viral, uh, what ended up happening is within three days, uh, actually that same day, Antiques Roadshow reached out and said, let's talk. Um, and uh, exactly. And so um, they no longer are appraising ivory on their show. So the power of the people. So kind of wrapping up this phase one of what we've been able to do in this first year, we've actually had 458,000 people take action. Um, and they've done 775,000 advocacy actions. Uh, what that fundamentally means is they've written to their local senator or their local congressman or their legislator. Uh, we actually had uh, young people from the ages of four uh, drawings and doing drawings that were then sent to the governors in the varying states on World Elephant Day. Uh, it was an incredible statement, and we got over six, almost $5.8 million of free media uh, thanks to the work of Horizon Media. Uh, they really did a great job in placement. And the revenue number you see there, the $1.5 million, we actually weren't even raising money. This is contributions that came, and that money has gone to four sites in Africa, Niasa and Salu, the two that I mentioned, uh, to help create new programs and to hire more park guards on the ground. 
and when we think about success, I mean, I look at success in many ways as, a, as somebody who's a part of the zoo community. What we've been able to do is we've gotten 124 zoos across the country to participate. We now have 191 organizations in 45 states that are part of the 96 Elephants Network. So it's pretty exciting to see how the power of the zoo community to really help move this issue and raise advocacy. And this is a kind of a, a great chart that we did, but uh, the fundamental piece there is that we were able to, obviously we were successful at the Antiques Roadshow, we were also successful in getting the US government to put $55 million specifically for wildlife trafficking to support law enforcement on the ground uh, over the next three to five years so that we can make a dent and help support these countries that are trying to stop these terrorists from destabilizing their countries. And here in the United States, we were actually able to get the US government to start working towards a federal ban. And then in New Jersey and New York, we passed legislation to have state bans in place as well. So it was a busy, it was a busy first year. So where do we go from here? Well, these are our goals for, uh, uh, and yeah, I think the first group to actually see these, but uh, number one is we want to support this ban that the federal government's putting in place. Now, what, you're probably asking, well, if you have a federal ban, why do you need a state ban? So federal law will focus on interstate and, in, and import and export of ivory. Intrastate within a state is not necessarily covered, so therefore you need state laws to be able to cover the sale of ivory within a state. But first, we want to work on a federal, make sure that the federal ban stays in place. Second is we're working on passing ivory moratorium in key states. This year, um, we're really focusing on California because New York, California, and Hawaii are the three largest markets in the U.S. Speaking with the president of your organization, I, I quickly am realized that Iowa is probably a transit hub as well because of the role that you play in the highways that are here. And, and Iowa, I think, is going to become important next year as we think about what, how we're going to move forward and what are the next set of states that we want to work on. Uh, third, passage of the Wildlife Enforcement Act. What that fundamentally is is we're trying to increase the amount of penalties on uh, sales of ivory uh, nationally. So what ends up happening now is there are things called the RICO statute. If anybody watches Law and Order, you've probably heard some of these terms, right? The RICO statute, fundamentally, uh, wildlife crime is not, um, is not part of that. It's not what's called a predicate offense for that crime. So if, if we can make it a predicate offense, then there'll be higher penalties for people that are selling um, uh, ivory illegally. Uh, fourth, creating consumer pressure for ivory dealers. You, right now, and I'll show you a picture in a moment, you, know, you can buy ivory online. It's relatively easy to go online right now, get on your smartphone, and, if, and you put in antique ivory, you can probably find many pieces of, of ivory that you can purchase. And last but not least, we want to try to launch some high-profile events to galvanize people to continue this educational campaign. So <clears throat> here at the state level, you see, I mean, and I want to say, this is all being done voluntarily. We, we don't have a huge advocacy campaign team. You know, there's no, there's no uh, million dollar budget here. This is being done by citizen advocates across the country. And we've gotten these pieces of legislation introduced, and there's several more states that have introduced it. And I, and I know that it was mentioned that Iowa, you have introduced a, a piece of legislation. We've been working, as I said, across the country. But um, why do I have a picture of uh, the Coliseum? because Rome wasn't built in a day. And I know you had a setback this year, but the fact is you cannot give up. This is one of those things where we have to work year in and year out. So clearly, we were successful in New York last year. You know, Knock on wood, we're gonna continue to be successful in, in California, but we're gonna have to continue the fight in many other states and right here as well. On the consumer strategy, um, this is a photo that, that I took off of Facebook, I'm sorry, off of Craigslist. You can buy this piece of antique uh, Chinese ivory uh, for $4,500. There are other pieces that are significantly less. Now, there's no way of proving whether this piece is antique or not, but they just wrote the word antique and here you go. So this is what's happening day in and day out right here in the United States. And we're working on several events since there was a crush of ivory in November of 13, since then there's actually been two tons of illegal ivory collected in the United States alone. So we're looking at doing a crush of that ivory sometime in the spring of this year. And then 
World Elephant Day, August 12th. Um, that's another day where we really want to reach out to the zoo community and all of you to do something to raise awareness of this crisis. Potentially another uh, uh, letter writing campaign or doing something with young people as well. We're open to ideas and love to hear them. And I'm going to share with you a, a 30 second PSA. I think you have, again, you're the first group to see this PSA that we've just completed. It's, a, um, it's actually um, computer generated, so hopefully it will work. United States and China have each crushed more than six tons of ivory. These fragments are all that remains of countless elephants. In the past three years alone, 100,000 elephants have been killed for their tusks. We can't turn back time, but together we can reverse this trend. Don't be the generation that allowed elephants to go extinct. Take a stand for elephants. So I'm happy to report that Billy Joel is going to narrate that for us. So uh, yeah, so we're very excited. The piano man himself uh, is going to, has actually narrated, he actually narrated it last week at his concert in Manhattan. And we're, we're getting it done right now. So we'll have it officially completed hopefully next week. So I never end a, a, a speech or any conversation without saying what you can do to help. And I think it's important for you all to realize the critical role that you can play in this. It's about joining the work that's being done here at the Blank Park Zoo, coming online at 96elephants.org uh, 96 and signing up and sending a letter to your local elected officials, sharing this information on your Facebook page and your Twitter feeds. And I throw out this one idea that I've mentioned uh, to my colleague here about maybe we do a run for the wild. We did one last year here in the Bronx. We did a great run. We had 5,000 people run for elephants. And um, we're very excited about figuring out maybe this is something that we could do um, here at Blank Park Zoo and maybe do this nationally and find a, a group of zoos that would want to work together to uh, really raise the profile of wildlife and through a run. Um, became a great way for us to get many people involved. Uh, we had these great stanchions that people could take photos in front of, et cetera. But the bottom line is it was a fantastic way of getting families involved in this project and doing something that was a lot of fun. And then, you know, I, I am a complete political junkie. This is Iowa. I mean, you all have more uh, reporters by, per square inch than anywhere in the world. Uh, I was told, oh, you just came a few minutes. You, somebody said to me, you came a few months too early. <laughs> you should have come a few months. And they're probably right. I should have come a few months. Maybe I'll come back. But the point is, you are going to be meeting uh, in your daily activities, potentially presidential candidates, CNN, Fox reporters, wh whomever. Uh, it would not hurt for you to say, by the way, I know there are many weighty issues in the world. Don't forget that saving elephants and stopping wildlife crime is one of the things that we can do at a very low cost with incredible benefits, not only for us, but for, for future generations. And I leave, uh, I, I end with this. Uh, this was a drawing done by a child at the Prospect Park Zoo. And I gave it to Governor Cuomo. And I said, the governor, I said to the governor, Governor, you have a chance to make history. And it's more than just making history here in New York, but you're helping to save elephants and you're making sure that they're going to be elephants for future generations. And I think um, the words that this young person decided to write, help me and my family. So that's the job that we have here together. Thank you very much. So I am now here to answer any questions that you may or may not have. And if you don't have questions, I'll come out and call on you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We, it's amazing. You know, it's really incredible when, when you think about how intelligent they are. And, and at the Bronx Zoo, we did some work on uh, self-recognition of elephants. They're incredibly smart uh, animals. They are matriarchal. It's a matriarchal family. Um, they mourn their dead. It's, it's incredible when you start thinking about what we're doing to this species. And, they are the engineers of where they live. They, they've been on this planet for millions of years, and we're going to be the generation that's going to see them disappear. For what? So that you could wear an ivory jewelry? I mean, are we serious?
I mean, is that what this society has come to? Is that what humanity is about? I mean, at some point, this is not a Democrat or Republican issue. This is about humanity. What do we stand for as human beings? And if we can't come together on something like this, where not only is it destroying this majestic species, but we're destabilizing large tranches of Africa, where we're literally hundreds of people are being killed. You know, wildlife crime right now is the fourth largest international crime. That's what it is. It's fourth. And you know, the other ones you can probably figure out pretty quickly. It's guns, it's, it's, um, it's uh, for drugs and, and slavery. And then this. And the bottom line is if we deal with this one, they're using the same routes. What's being found out through work that we're doing with the UN and other groups, what we're finding out is that the same patterns are being used. These, these, these groups, these criminal groups, are fundamentally, many of them are the same that are doing a lot of these other crimes. So by tackling this issue, it will have other uh, knock-on positive benefits. So thank you for that question. <laughs> Gave me a chance to kind of have a cathartic moment. Yes. <laughs> we, we actually, if you go to WCS Run for the Wild, if you look at WCS Run for the Wild, we've been doing this run now for the past six years. Last year, we had 5,200 people run. And, and I'm thinking collectively, if we as a community could say, we want to do a WCS run for the wild, and I'm, and I'm not even saying that the money comes to WCS, but I'm saying if we can agree collectively that we want to do this, and I'm not even sure we need to all agree on the same species, but that conceptually that we're doing this, and then we could then go to some of the larger sponsors and be able to raise more money and more importantly, educate people about these issues. So maybe we could do it uh, thematically. My point is really not about the WCS run or on specifically on elephants, but we collectively need to start thinking differently about our role as, as zoo institutions. We need to start thinking about our responsibility to help create this wildlife movement. And as you know, the way you could do that is by identifying two or three you know, kind of projects that we collectively will work on. So somebody was, you know, the run that we do in New York is really almost like a race for the cure, a run for the cure. People then will donate and, and uh, we've, it's been very successful for us. And I think we've got, we figure out how to do it and we're happy to work with others to help them figure out how to do it. But I think it's this idea that we have to do it under one, at least marketing umbrella. I hate to use that term, but it's real under one umbrella. So we figure out how it is and then, you know, the resources we can figure out. That's, that's interesting. It's, that's less important to me. It's really more about educating this next generation of people on why we should care about wildlife. So we were founded by the Boone and, Cro Boone and, Cro Boone and Crockett Club. So I think one of, yeah, 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 we were founded by hunters. No, I, I, you know, I think, I think there's a, people have to understand that, um, you know, my father's, my father's been a hunter. I mean, we, we are, I mean, I know, from the Bronx, yes, we, there was, <laughs> he was a deer hunter. He went deer hunting, so um, I ate a great deal of venison growing up. Um, but the, the point is that hunters are sometimes some of your best conservationists, and I think it's important for us to understand that we have to have a, a, a big tent idea. Now, candidly, can, you know, there are species where you can do that and there are species where you can't, right? And I think that's part of the conversation that needs to be had with, with the hunting community. But by and large, we've had very, very good success working with uh, the hunting community, Ducks Unlimited. There's so many really great groups that we partner with in Washington, D.C. And um, I helped create a, a coalition called the Species Coalition, which really supports species conservation in the federal budget. And we had at this one meeting, we had the Humane Society and um, the Feld Entertainment, the, the people run Ringling Brothers. And I sat in the middle because I, just, I didn't want him, you know, I was like, okay, we're all together. All right, okay, we all agree, let's get out of the room before the fists fly. But I think what we need to, when we think about wildlife, at least when I do, I think it's one of those issues that can bring many people together. It's really one of those things that helps unite us as opposed to divide us. So the NRA, I'm glad somebody raised the question of the NRA. I, um, the NRA has uh, come out um, in principle against the ivory bands. And the reason why they have is because 
they were, again, unfor unfortunately mistaken, but they believed that this would somehow stop people from being able to sell their ivory-handled guns. So, um, so therefore, we, we, there's an exemption in the, le in the legislation that if it's a de minimis amount of ivory, which is less than 20%, you would then be able to sell the product, sell, sell it. So therefore, it's a de minimis amount. We have not had that conversation with the NRA lately, so therefore it would be great to have it so that they understand that we're actually not trying to stop people from owning their guns or being able to sell their guns. We also had another group, the musicians. Uh, they have uh, bows with a little bit of ivory at the tip. I mean, we're talking about less than a tenth of an ounce. Um, and therefore, you know, we're in New York, so I worked very closely with Carnegie Hall and we worked out language so that they would still be able to have their bows. So, you know, I, I think what's most important is I'm a relatively practical person. We need to find out what are some of these issues, raise them, because that's not the problem. The problem is when you can go on Craigslist and buy that piece of ivory, that's an elephant tusk. That's one tusk. You know, that's an elephant that was killed. You know, a tenth of an ounce is a de minimis, literally de minimis amount of ivory. That's not the problem. I'm glad you, I, you just became part of the committee. So <laughs> don't ask a question to me, because you'll end up, you'll be on a committee. I, I will tell you that we have started that. So of, um, I talked about World Elephant Day last year, and we had this kind of crazy idea that we wanted to generate 96,000 letters and drawings from kids and their families. And um, we kind of made this, because of 96, again, using that number. Well. We actually generated 111,000. And we were able to get letters from almost every state in the country and, and drawings from young people from every state in the country. Um, I mean, Disney World, uh, Animal Kingdom at Disney participated. We, it was really an amazing statement. If you go on 96elephants.org, there's a section there on that cradle to cane. You know, how do we get people involved? There's materials there for young people, what you could do at home with your children to tell them about the, the issue. Because again, we want to make sure that what, what we're talking about is appropriate for the age, right? So there, there's some, I, I kept a lot of the gruesome photos out, but there's some really tough stuff that may be not inappropriate for someone that age. Having said that, I'm always very open to people going on the site, seeing what's there, and if there are things that we could do, if things that we could add, realize that that is a resource that we, we give to the whole community. So please take a look and let us know what we have there, if it's enough or not. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And I think when you think about the role that we have played as a community over the last year and a half, how many people even knew about the elephant crisis two years ago? I mean, you, know, you think about how far we've come in such a short amount of time that citizen action actually can work and you can make a difference. So thank you, thank you for sharing that. I don't know. I, I, don't, I do not know that. Yeah. I mean, the, the problem is, so the, the, what, why, are the, why are forest elephants actually going extinct sooner? Because they're in the forest, their, their tusks are being, are kind of, um, uh, are thicker and longer and straighter, so they're actually easier to carve. So the fact is, like for example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, there's probably no elephants left in the whole country. There may be some remnants. And in Garamba, in, in uh, Congo, there are some. So the point is, depending on where you are um, in Africa, you know, there's different types of species. This, I, have, I'm, I apologize, I, I don't know about that specific issue, but I'm curious to learn more after. It's one of those issues, you know, I'm a lawyer, so I, I, uh, I come to this as a, from the advocacy realm, and I just sit there and you could, you could sit with two biologists and have 18 opinions. I don't know. I mean, to me, they seem relatively different, and if you look at how you frame these questions, but it seems one of those issues that's going to um, hang around for a while until you all figure out what it should be or not be. But for right now, I, the way I think of it, there are two different groups of elephants that are fundamentally being decimated, um, one's going to probably go before the other, unless we do something.
Well, if you know anybody at Animal Planet, I will that will get you on. <laughs> So where we, we, the, the short answer is we've actually had some of the stuff already on Animal Planet, and they've done some great stuff. Yeah, you just haven't seen it, but uh, the National Geographic, uh, we work very close with National Geographic, and they've done some incredible stuff. They're doing another movie now, uh, a follow-up to the John Hemingway film that was done last year. But um, on Animal Planet, I, they've, they've worked with many of our partners, and I think that's the other thing. Uh, this will only work if people own it in the sense that it can't just be the Wildlife Conservation Society or 96 elephants. It has to be our 191 partners that go out and help share and share the information. So if you have a connection at Animal Planet or you want to write a letter to Animal Planet, I would suggest you do that and say, I'd like to see more stuff on the elephant crisis. That might be a, a, a great way of making sure that they're doing more information and sending out more information. So the, uh, the, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why animals die, right? And I, I'm, I'll leave that to the biologists and people studying that. But right now, what, what we've been doing is you look at something called the percentage of illegally killed elephants, the pike rates. And, and um, through the work that we've been doing, through that GPS work that we've been doing and working with other groups, we can start seeing pike rates uh, um, around Africa. And what we're finding is that most elephants uh, in these areas are dying because they were killed illegally. So we're not finding, you know, it's not, like for example, in gorilla populations, our scientists had found that Ebola had a devastating impact on, on gorilla populations in Africa. So in the future, maybe one of my colleagues from in, that has done work on that, some of our vet team has done work on that, the, the real issue there has been Ebola and, and literally decimated. That's not what we've found right now. The number one killer, unfortunately, is poaching. And that poaching is coming uh, through organized uh, groups. So for example, uh, we work in the Central African Republic. And um, there was a, a coup in the Central African Republic. And um, there was a group called the Selica Front, which is a basically a Sudanese a group that was coming down into uh, CAR, and they came into Zangabai, the area where we work, and they killed 24 elephants. And they took their, you know, they didn't even take the meat, they just took the, the, the tusks and left. Um, that's what's happening right now. These groups that are coming in, filling orders for their uh, buyers in uh, mostly in East Asia. Yes, so what happened is uh, there's been a little bit of, of uh, misinformation about that. And actually, CBS made the mistake, uh, which we corrected uh, for CBS. What happened is China has fundamentally said they're going to stop importing ivory for a year. Not that they're going to stop selling ivory. They stop importing ivory. The fact is they already have probably enough ivory in the country to be able to do what they need to do. Um, so it. It's a wonderful first step, but I really, we got to keep it in perspective. It's really a first step. What we want them to do is what we're doing here, which is closing our ivory markets so that we can get up some breathing room so that elephant populations can come back. But again, you have to understand that China's made tremendous strides in the last two years. Two years ago, um, when, when she was still Secretary of State, when Secretary Clinton went there in the fall of 2012, they, they basically were telling her, we don't have a problem here. There's no issue. So two years later, they've now realized they have an issue, that they're, they're part of the problem, the way we're the part of the problem. And I think that's the important thing. This is not China versus the US or US versus China. This is a really a collective issue that we need to work on together. So by them making that statement is a huge first step for them. Um, and we're hopeful that with time, and with continued uh, positive pressure that we'll, we'll get them to, to do uh, a ban the way we're doing it here. Any Thank other? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.